campsite set up on the riverbank. This is why we do it. This is it. Everything we do in four-wheel driving and overlanding, at the end of the day, this is the reward. And it's worth every toll, every roadblock, every flat, every, you name it. Good night's sleep. It poured with rain all night. It's early September and September for the rains is very early. And as you can see the ground around me, um, it poured, I mean, it really, the whole night, we were in tented accommodation. We basically just pulled off the road. We we're about uh, less than an hour from the Botswana border and a comfortable night and the vehicle is finally done. After all of that effort, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. But we've got a fantastic piece of kit. I present to you the Isuzu 3 litre turbo diesel double cab four wheel drive. It has part time four wheel drive, uh, it has electronic four wheel drive engagement system, uh, electric rear differential lock. I have uh, Easy On tent at the top, a Easy On uh, roof rack bush tech canopy BF Goodrich tires and that's it inside I'll show you later I've kept it pre pretty simple uh, we've got convenience but I haven't gone mad and I've got a simple fridge in the back so there it is our companion for the next four weeks as we head into Zambia and Malawi I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and traveling to the remotest parts of the world. These videos are made possible by contributions from Patreons. Join the Patreon family now. My daughter Kate is traveling with me. She was with me last year, if you remember, when I was doing my final Africa trip in my great Greenland cruiser. Hi. Day one, we're in Botswana. We decided to go through Botswana and not um, Zimbabwe because of all the hassles in Zimbabwe. And at the moment, we are in wonderful Botswana, driving north from the town of Nata, which is in the middle of the country, and heading to Kasani. Now, here's the wonderful thing. As we head north, uh, sun setting uh, to our west, um, we're heading into kind of no man's land because well between here where we are and our destination where we actually cross over to Zambia a place called Kasangula there really are no places to camp 300 to Kasangula okay yeah. well we've done 20 that makes sense so we're going to wild camp tonight and this particular road is one of those few roads left in Africa where you can actually find wild animals roaming freely. So what we're going to do is we've looked on the map and we figured that uh, on the latitude of 19 degrees, was it, it was 15 minutes, 15 minutes, there are two roads off to the east and we are going to try and find one of those roads and they lead to a small pan and it'll be our first overnight camp for our Zambia trip. One of the few places left on earth, a public road, not a national park. Elephants. Amazing. Never get used to it. I've seen it a hundred times. 
gets better every time. Um, a little bit stressful in that the, um, the coordinate we had, there was no road there. Or if it was there, it's grown over and we could not find it. So now getting late, 10 to 6, sun going down and the bush is very, very thick. I just want to get away from the road. We can wild camp anywhere, it's safe. Four wheel drive to start with. I've seen a suitable place. It's quite deep in the bush okay. where I think we will be far enough from the road and with okay. luck out of sight of it. I'm going to try and find our way through the bush and while avoiding Mopani stumps. Mopani is the most common tree in this area and notorious. Branches go through tires like a knife through hot butter. This is actually quite pretty. I want to get away from the road a little further and I see a place there. And the beauty of, of, of Botswana is that you, you can do this. It's, it's safe. It's not safe in most southern African countries. Northern Namibia, safe. Uh, Botswana, most of Botswana. It's safe. Oh wow, this is very pretty. I'm going to turn down here. There we can park on the pan. It's a very, very small pan. Let's just make sure it's not muddy. There you go. Katie's taking charge of cinematographer for She's going to be the chief cinematographer for this entire project. I'm going to direct her. And there's our tent. We haven't pitched the tent yet, so we're going to stop filming now because it's getting dark. But I can hear a car. But I can't see the lights. We're in a dip, which means we cannot be seen. Even our lights cannot be seen by passers on the road. So we are absolutely safe. I mean, we're safe anywhere, but we don't want to be disturbed. And... Uh, there's elephant dung around and hopefully there'll be some new elephant dung in the morning. Day two, wild camping on the edge of uh, the road. We pulled over last night, we were chasing the sun. We tried to find a particular coordinate where we saw on the map there was a road leading off into the bush where we could find a secluded place and we couldn't find that point. Even though we had the coordinates, obviously the track is, is, hasn't been used in a while and it's, and it's now overgrown and, and vanished. So we were chasing the light and eventually we did find a clear patch in very heavy bush. And we actually find ourselves in this small pan. We're quite close to the road. Now this is the main road that goes from Francistown, Nata, up to a place called Kasangula. Kasangula is the, at a unique point on the map where... Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe and Zambia meet right in the middle of the river and Kasangula is where we're going to cross and it's where all these trucks cross into Zambia and the reason why that so many trucks use this road is because the corruption in Zimbabwe is still very bad particularly for truck drivers they're, they're, they have to hand over money, hand over fist all the way through Zimbabwe so they just plain avoid it now. It's worth coming this route even though it's longer and slower. And there's the sun coming up over the bush. Isn't that magnificent? Okay, Kasangula Ferry, busy border post, managed to get through in about 40 minutes. Wasn't too bad. Uh, there was an extra form I had to sign, not a problem. There's Zambia, we're about to leave. These ferries go across the Chobe River all the time. It doesn't cost a lot and it, we, we, I mean, we left the shore within five minutes of boarding. We, uh, we set sail. We're about to land on Zambia. A new and unfamiliar border procedure can be a bit intimidating. And Zambia, while having a reputation for friendly people, doesn't have a similar reputation for easy border crossings. As it turned out, it wasn't particularly easy, nor particularly terrible. It took a little over an hour, 
so not too bad for this kind of crossing. Right, we are at Victoria Falls on the Zambian side. Now, I've only ever been here once. And uh, to be honest with you, I have very thin recollection of my visit here. I'm not sure why. I don't even have too many photographs. But anyway, this is Kate's very first visit to the, to the Victoria Falls. I first came here when I was seven years old. I've been here a few times. about uh, crossing that bridge there. They call this Danger Point. It's my middle name. <laughs> they say don't look down. So I'm going to get this to do it for me. It's disappointing the amount of water coming down. Four months ago, five months ago, this entire, virtually the entire line of rocks would be white with water. I can see some steam if you like over there which means a lot more water is flowing over there. Let's see if we can go and get a better view. The truth is though it wasn't. Zambia is suffering its worst drought in 20 years and since over 70% of Zambia's electricity is created by hydroelectric power means that the average Zambian only gets electricity for seven hours each day. Interestingly though, that land over there is actually Zambia. We're on Zambia as well. This is the chasm and has a closed end. But that piece of land just over there, I could almost throw a stone at it, is Zimbabwe. on the banks of the Sambezi River. It's day three. Um, I can't help whenever I come to lodges. Now we're not staying at the lodge so much, we're, we're camping. But I, I, I always remember how we used to run Delta Camp when, when Gwyn and I ran it. Good morning. Ah, yes please. Thank you. Um, and how we were so sensitive to the needs of guests and uh, subtle things. Here, I'm, I'm, I would rather listen to the birds than the pump pumping water for the little reservoir. Um, but instead, I've got the hum of that. We used to run it during the middle of the day when guests were sleeping and, and not doing bird listening things. Little things like that. Anyway, a very, very beautiful place. The biggest problem, of course, is to sort out the, the dieseline problem. Um, I'm going to send Kate in there with this. Um, water doesn't really help, it just spreads it around. I was, I was sleeping and I could smell dieseline the whole night. In amongst all the lion calls and the hippos, which made up for it. But I've got to try and get rid of the smell. I put on a dirty shirt in case I spill any diesel on me and I'm going to decant all of this now into our tank. They even <clears throat> offer a cup of coffee to the campers that come down to the reception. It's quite nice. <clears throat> Bought a post yesterday. My advice to you if you're going through Zambia, <clears throat> keep a cool head especially if you're going through one of the larger border posts. I thought we were going through one of the smaller ones, Kasungula. It is one of the smaller ones, but it's one of the hectic ones. The ferry crossing cost 200 pula. The uh, visas, two UK passport visas, 50, uh, there were 80 each uh, do US dollars, um, double entry visas. We were then taken for quite a bit of money for a total of five different forms and these were the forms the Zambia Revenue Authority for temporary importation of the vehicle this is the um, I think this was a road tax form then there's a carbon tax form uh, of course I had to have 
the re vehicle registration. Then there's a district council tax form. And then this one, which is the insurance form. I actually had to cross the border, walk across the border to go and purchase this insurance. The total cost was, I guess, about, um, I haven't actually counted the exact amount, about 350 US dollars to get through that border post. So an ex expensive morning, but Zambia, as you can see, is promising to be absolutely beautiful. Today we're heading up north, actually northwest, to uh, some falls that have been um, described to me as imagine Victoria Falls without all the tourists and without all the the people trying to sell you curios. Well those are the falls that we're going to today. Right now heading west uh, to the Ngonye Falls which are supposed to be spectacular also part of the Zambezi and the road is not what I expected. Now it's so easy to get this wrong when estimating times you, you you know you look up yes the road from a to b is tar this road all the way to um lua plains is tar but this tar is actually slower than a good gravel road so when calculating times it's actually impossible to know and to and it's wrong to assume that a tar road you will be able to maintain 80, 90 or 100 kilometers an hour. For the last hour and a half we've probably been averaging about 40 kilometers an hour. Anyway, uh, Nguanyo Falls is supposed to be the second Victoria Falls and in fact I've even read in Lowly Planet Guide it's something like imagine the Victoria Falls without all of the uh, tourists. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. We're at Ngonya Falls reception and it has a rather eclectic array of locally acquired ornaments. To get to the falls means a walk and it turns out we have our own guide. Well, it's, uh, it's 36 degrees and it looks like it's a bit of a walk and uh, the water level looks quite low here as well which is no surprise. As we're getting a bit closer, the wow factor is getting larger. One thing though, it's quite a long walk. Take water, we didn't take water, we weren't told how long the walk was, is, so uh, we didn't take water. Oh man, this is unbelievable. Why don't people, more people know about this? Like Victoria Falls without the tourists, eh? I read this in the Lonely Planet Guide. A bigger overstatement I can't imagine. Ngonya Falls is about 300 kilometers upstream from Victoria Falls. I'm trying to imagine what these falls would be like if the water level was even at its normal level. Ngonyo Falls has been formed by the same geological processes as Victoria, with cracks in the basalt being eroded to form the drop. Their height is only about 10 to 25 meters, but with a width comparable to Victoria. There are in fact seven separate waterfalls. Definitely worth the walk. Definitely you're going to need water to carry water with you. Um, it's not a particularly long walk, but at 30, in 36 degrees, it's quite a long walk. Worth coming here, it's the ideal spot if you're going up to Lua Plains from Livingston. It's not quite halfway, but it's the perfect stop off and an amazing place. I'm on my expedition to discover the beauty and majesty found in the remote Zambian bush. I'm traveling with my daughter Kate. And we've traveled from Livingstone and are now at the Ngonyo Falls, about to head off for the fabled Lua Plains. Well, the campsite, this is the community campsite at Ngonyo Falls. 
very peaceful. We were the only ones here. Uh, there's a chap that comes and fills the, the, the donkey boilers for you. Uh, of course, the water is cold. There is a long, it's not a long drop toilet, a proper, proper throne. Um, area here for preparing one's meals. Hey, what do you think of that, eh? Rustic. It's half past seven and it's already starting to get warm. So I think another scorcher today. This part of Zambia is sparsely populated and well into their dry season. Dust fills the air. Right, the road to uh, Lua Plains has turned quite bad. Uh, speeds down from 70 kilometers an hour right down to 40 kilometers an hour or lower crossing this bridge. So our drive, which I estimated would take four hours to Lua, is probably now going to take us at least eight. Anyway, very exciting country, part of Zambia that I've never been to before. The route to Lua means crossing the Zambezi River two more times, and this means ponds. Now waiting for the pond to cross the Zambezi, and the pond I've been told is uh, not working. Uh, these people around here, about four other vehicles, have uh, been waiting for so, several hours for them to repair it. So um, I'm going to stand clear and just let them get on with it and hopefully, hopefully it won't take too long. In the meantime, we can listen to the local music. Yes. The Pontuno. I want to take pictures. Pictures? Yes. Okay, to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this man <clears throat> latched himself onto me for some reason. He's been drinking quite heavily and giving me permission to do various things like photograph things. So um, he's been a bit of a pain in the backside actually. Uh, people like that you have to be polite and courteously tell them to go away by just ignoring them. You one shouldn't tell them to go away because then they'll be offended. But if you ignore them, it tends to work a little bit better. So right now, a uh, lovely African scene and very typical in many respects really, because the pond is broken and still broken. Are you a, fish Are you a fisherman? Yeah, I'm a fisherman. Oh, okay. Yes. And then you sell your fish in the villages? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> if we can't cross today, we've got a bit of a logistical headache because I've I'm at the point of no return when, when it comes to fuel. This is why you carry extra fuel when traveling in Africa. You need a contingency plan. And we're at, I'm at the edge of that, I'm at that point of no return in terms of how much fuel I've got in the vehicle. So if I can't cross here and get to Mongu, uh, then I have to turn around and I can do nothing else but go back to the last town, which is just within the range of the fuel I've got in the vehicle. That's why you carry that extra little bit of fuel because then it's just, you, 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 you then have options. We'll see what happens in the next half hour and then decide what we do. Okay, it looks like we're, uh, we're going. The motor on the pont roared to life and the cars now making their way down. I don't know how many cars can go on it, but I would say two, maybe three. Hello. 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 Uh, passenger, Hi. passenger out. Yeah? Uh, okay, passenger out. You're oh. going to jump out like you did before. It's for safety reasons that only drivers are permitted inside vehicles when embarking the pond. Again, for safety reasons, when climbing onto the pond, put your vehicle in four-wheel drive and do the same when getting off. This prevents the unlikely but possible scenario where your one wheel's on the pond and your other wheels are stuck in the sand. Ah, sure. Okay, well we're on. 
there's one car behind us still coming to on. Okay, he's going to park right where you are. So. I must say I'm really impressed with Kate. I don't think she's ever been in this kind of environment before. We crammed quite tightly onto the pond, lots of people around. Uh, she could easily be feeling really quite nervous and intimidated. She's clearly not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 150. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Now, the wise thing to do is wait. I think. bit of four-wheel drive stuff to get up the riverbank this is what this is what travel in Africa is all about and scenes like that cost us an hour and a half but man I wouldn't missed it hey don't you think I mean really it's that's 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 what makes Africa travel amazing because you never know what you're gonna find around the next corner riverbed whatever when I left England, uh, I said I was going to, uh, going to Zambia. And the first thing was, is it, is it safe there? It's safe. The people were smiling and they were, it's safe. It, it really is safe. It might be very, feel very foreign. That's why it's so fantastic. And of course, I was freaking out the whole time. My South African roots, the car's unlocked. Everything's gonna get stolen. Just, <laughs> the whole time. Um... Roadworks. Roadworks everywhere, and the dust is terrible. <laughs> and it looks like yet another pond. At this point on the maps, there's a bridge, and there it is, a long way away. So, yet another river crossing, and yet another pond. Unexpected, not written on any of the maps, so it's going to take another hour or so. But what is amazing is the they're actually building a road to Lua. My question is why? This would be an incredibly expensive road building project because for the last at least 30 kilometers we've been driving through swamp and they're building bridges over all the rivers and across all the swamps. It must be costing a full, small fortune and not surprisingly done by the Chinese. group of South African contractors has asked Kate to take their picture. They're here installing water level measuring equipment all through Zambia. While these crossings do take a bit of time, they're a fantastic break from sitting behind the wheel. They're slow and give you enough time to take in the atmosphere. Looks like we run aground. I'm reversing the vehicles on the pond to get the nose in the air so that they can beach it because they can't get ashore. There's too big a gap between the, the shore and the, uh, and the pond. My big worry now is time. We have, um, it's 20 to 5, it's dark by 6 and we've got to try and make a campsite. I don't really want a wild camp. Uh, I'm going to try and find a campsite and 
Oh well, we'll see how it goes. This is the, the stresses of overland travel in Africa. Um, well, we're at Kalabu and we didn't make the park in time because so many, it's a long day, so we couldn't find a camping site, so now we have found this lovely lodge and it's rather interesting. So we'll just show you the room and the lovely health and safety. Oh, okay. I'm glad there's a put in there. Have a bed in. The bed in. Yeah. You're going to go okay. There was only one bed in the room, so they obliged us by adding another. TV. What could be better? Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it looks clean, and to me that's everything. If it's clean, then it's okay. And uh, we met some of the people around here. Friendly, friendly. They say that Zambia is. Africa's friendliest country, they say. Who says it? I think Zambians say it. Might be true. Very friendly. Really. Very friendly indeed. So, um, interesting night ahead, I imagine. But I, I would actually like to settle into the room now, but we can't because the chap in there is actually not <laughs> fixing the television. What he's doing is he's paying his home DSTV license on the hotel's TV, so he gets it for free, or something like that. Coming the most unique act in the U.S. of A. I love you. The show-stopping 10th anniversary season of America's Got Talent. Weeknights at 6.30 on Amnet Channel 101. Or live stream on DSTV Now. Also available on DSTV Catch-Up. Um, we had a uh, interesting night, very very noisy, the music stopped, I don't know when, very very late into the night, in fact when I woke up this morning, um, it's now just after 6 o'clock, uh, music was still playing. Slept in the tent, not in the accommodation, because the mosquitoes were trying to carry us off. And uh, we eventually, in the middle of the night, said no, none, none of this. Uh, we'll go and sleep in the tent. There are crocodiles. They're not right here. This is the Lua River. Beyond it, the Lua Plains and the Lua Plains National Park. Unfortunately, this is where our Western Zambia trip has to come to an end. We've literally run out of time. Traveling through Zambia takes a lot of time, and although there are sections of tar, your speed is never more than 100, and when it gets gravel, your speed can easily drop down to 20. And we've had a mixture, so it's very difficult to plan. I, the research I did indicated that I would be able to visit here just for two days and make it worthwhile. Turns out it's absolutely not worthwhile. It would take now approximately a six hour drive right now to see the first game. The game is scattered and where it is concentrated is right up in the northern part of the park. And that's how long it'll take us to get there. So, uh, and then it'll, we of course have to come back via this crossing and the pond that we crossed yesterday to get back to Mongu to head east towards Kufu, which is our next stop. So the decision is, do we do Kui, Kufu, do we do Lua? Now, given the game is scattered, given the environment is very, very smoky because of the, the, the fires everywhere, the light isn't nice, it's not a good time of year, September, to come to Lua. The best time is to come is November. The animals are moving, the first rains have fallen, and it's life regenerated, and that's the time to come to Lua. So I have a choice, Kafui Lua. Given these conditions, we have decided Kafui. It's day six of my expedition to discover the delights of Zambia. I'm traveling with my daughter, Kate, who's doing most of the camera work. We entered the country at Kasangula, 
via the pont crossing the Okavango River, followed the Zambezi as far as the Ngonyo Falls, and are now heading towards Kafui National Park. Right, we're in Kafui. Information regarding Kafui has been difficult to come by, so we are heading into the unknown. Quite a dull morning, although Zambia continues to surprise. The road from Kalabu uh, to Kafui has taken mo most of the day, a mixture of high-speed tar, extremely slow potholed tar and gravel. And the place is completely different. Everything about it, the colour of the ground, the colour of the earth, the colour of the trees, even the colour of the sky. Kafui looks amazing. A lot of Zambia, at least Western Zambia, has been denuded by fires and I figured out what's going on. I would say 80%, and that's probably not an exaggeration, of the, the ground, the landscape, through which we've been travelling, is black with ash. It's been burnt. Now, mostly it's ash because people flush out the game. They actually poach the game. They kill the animals and many do it to live. But there's also this industry. This is charcoal. And this is found all over the country. And it's actually a fuel source where local people uh, take trees, cut them, and um, create, create charcoal. And often you'll see around the villages, you'll have a village, and all around it, all the trees have been culled and burnt, blackened. And there are no shade trees yet left. And I suppose after a period of time, the village dies because there's no shade for miles. There are no trees for miles. I suppose they just move the village, build their hut somewhere else, and, uh, and then continue the process of deforestation. So it's very damaging. That's the contrast here in Kafui. Obviously, that's not the case in this national park. It's lush. It just shows you what nature does when there are not people around to change it. Okay, I'll go. I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. I really don't mind. Okay, so we've arrived at the banks of the Kafui River. We're going to spend the first night outside of the reserve because of the very high park fees, but we're then we're going to spend two nights in the reserve. And I want to check in. This is Roy's campsite. Ungweng Ningwe is the proper name for this campsite. And I have an elephant stopping me from checking in and setting up my camp. But I don't mind. Really, I really don't mind. At last, at last, we found a campsite on well, it's not the Zambezi River, but it's pretty damn close. So we actually got a beautiful campsite. How's this? Actually, this is quite good. I need to come back very slightly to make it level. Isn't this amazing? We have an incredible sunset across the water, and we have an elephant to keep us company. We've been watching the hippos now for an hour. Campsite set up on the riverbank. This is why we do it. This is it. Everything we do in four-wheel driving and overlanding at the end of the day, this is the reward. And it's worth every toll, every roadblock, every flat, every you name it. Day seven on the banks of the Kafui River. 
amazing morning waking up. We're not actually in the National Park and yet we're actually surrounded by animals. Um, of course we had the elephant yesterday and the hippo in the water. The hippo is still in the water, still making lots of noise. Hyena, uh, not far away, we can hear them. And the sun coming up, idyllic setting. Today we're going to not be spending too much time in the vehicle driving. We've actually had six days virtually non-stop driving. So today we're going into the, the Kafui National Park. We'll be camping in the reserve and we'll be spending two nights in the reserve and it's a slow game drive um, on the way in. So we're really going to take our time. It's also a great time in the morning now to to clean up camp, clean camera equipment, because we don't have a rush, we don't have a, a, a mean deadline to meet. So that's what we're doing this morning. And of course, last night, see every time I go on one of these expeditions and photograph them and make my videos, I look for great sunsets. Oh, who wouldn't? Last night was my very first 4K sunset and I would say one of the finest sunsets I've seen in many, many a trip. Here it is again. We've got some time this morning to head into town for some supplies. We're also going to see if we can buy some cell phone data, as we've been unable to do so in any of the towns thus far. We have been completely out of touch. Our uh, South African and British SIM cards did not work and, um, and neither did our Zambian SIM card work. Uh, until now, three days it took to register the card that we bought. We're now going to try and buy some data. Tariff plans. We have to choose a bundle, but the lady behind the counter doesn't like the YouTube. camera. You know YouTube? YouTube, I, I'm making a video on YouTube. Yeah, see. <laughs> um, I'm trying to explain myself. Huh, I'm not really getting through. Cheers. <laughs> oh, he seemed to help. That's really quite typical of Zambians. They're always around to help. It's working. It's got a message. Okay, so it looks like we have a success. Seven days of trying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, even when you're walking down these, uh, these streets and these markets, even when you're not holding a camera as I am doing now, you'll be stared at, you'll be watched. It's just because you're, it's a little unusual. They, they do have... Um, you got there? African monarch butterfly. <laughs> Tourists are not common. Well, they, they, they're used to them, they do see them. But uh, out the way, Kate, just be careful behind you. Uh, keep your wits about you because it's, it's, it's a mad rush and everybody's crazy and you can buy absolutely everything here from motorbikes to bicycles to, uh, as it turns out, uh, airtime and data, watch out, watch out behind you. But you've got to really, really be aware of, of what's going on around you because it's, uh, it's hectic. Need any bras? You mean, do I need any really hideous infections? No, thanks. No, 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 it's not like that at all. That's the whole point of this, actually not like that. I reckon you can get some fantastic fresh fruit, vegetables. Uh, it's just the way of shopping is a little bit chaotic oh, yeah, but we bought bre that bread we bought today it's good bread i think it's good bread it's soft and fresh it's fantastic it just took a bit of finding the whole street is a department store you know it's like the old the old traditional high street watch out behind you except more dangerous yeah <laughs> right after refreshing our supplies we're back in the Kafui National Park. We're heading north. Now, the road, the main road that travels through Kafui is open to all traffic. You sign in, you sign up, no problem. When you then leave the road, you're then entering the park 
proper and they charge you. Uh, in our case, they charged us for um, a foreign vehicle, foreigners and camping. I imagine that the camping site is going to be fairly rudimentary. I can't imagine anything special at all. Uh, but we are in Kafui, true Kafui National Park. Uh, it'll take us um, two hours to get to the campsite. And we're doing it quite slowly, looking out for animals, lots of fresh signs of elephant and tsetse fly. So inside the car, there he is there. Okay, he'll cling to the windscreen. I just went in. Where is he? Is he in the back? There, he's in the back. He's in the back. Okay, the tsetses are an interesting animal. They cling to the car. They are attracted by this shade. They don't like sunlight, they like shade, so they'll often sit in a shady part of the car, under the wing mirror, um, under the wheel arches, and they'll actually wait until you open the window and then climb inside the car. Uh, and it is the reason why this part of Zambia, in fact, most of Zambia that we've traveled through, except for the far east, that's uh, far west, um, devoid of cattle, very, very little cattle. And in this area, no cattle at all. And this is why the tsetse fly uh, give the cattle sleeping sickness and uh, they just, uh, you just cannot keep cattle uh, in an area where there is tsetse fly. Kufala campsite, Kafuri National Park. It's the closest campsite north of the main road. Fine. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Celebrating end of day six. Yeah, cool. Cheers. Sorry, no, you got that wrong. Yeah. It's day seven. Must be all these tsetse fly bites making you lose your ability to count or something. And the reason why I am no longer, I'm spoiled, you see, no longer prepared to just take a cool box on expedition. It has to be a good fridge. Set at minus three. I've just been bitten by a tsetse fly, first one that got me today. Got me under, under in, the, in the palm of my hand as I was holding the beer like this. And it's tip, that's very typical. They will tend to bite under the knee or under the, under the arm. They'll go for places like shade. They don't, they don't like sun, sunlight. They're endemic to sub-Saharan Africa um, and have been completely eradicated in Botswana. Then you might find a few pockets right up in the north of Botswana. Likewise, Zimbabwe. They've all gone. Maybe a few pockets in the northern part of Zimbabwe. Zambia, there are, they're here. But they shouldn't be feared. They shouldn't be something that you should worry about. Oh dear, I'm going to get bitten by these things and they're going to be a menace and I'm going to get sick. That's not the case. Rarely does a bite, if very rarely, does a bite actually affect a human. Uh, if it does, it's completely curable. And they're not that bad that often in that many places. So it's not as if your trip, it's unlikely that your trip is going to be ruined or even a campsite is going to be ruined because of, a, of an overwhelming number of tsetse flies. Generally close to water, there are fewer of them than out in the, in the uh, plains where it's hotter and drier. And when you stop your vehicle, if you stop it in the sunshine, bright sunshine, you will get far fewer tsetse flies around the vehicle than you will if you stop it and open the doors in shade. In very bad areas, if you stop it in shade, you'll actually get lots of, lots of them coming straight into the car. Carry some inspect insecticide, do a quick spray inside the car and wait two minutes and they'll be gone. They're very susceptible to poison. Poison takes them out extremely quickly. So do that and you'll eradicate them completely from your vehicle. The Zambian banknotes are very interesting uh, with a common theme of wildlife. Fish eagle, this is the hundred kwacha with the cape buffalo. The 50 Again, the fish eagle and leopard. The 20 with a, looks like a lechwe. The 10, porcupine. 
Some of them get very tatty indeed. The five with a lion. And lastly, the two quite note with what I think is a roan antelope. That's it. I can't help compare the Botswana parks with the Zambia parks and what they give you because they're both very expensive, high tariff just to camp. And generally speaking in Botswana you get an enclosure to swing a shower and an enclosure, uh, sometimes long drop toilet, sometimes a proper plumbed long drop toilet. But here, and this is not the first time we've experienced it in Zambia, um, just more. Now, firstly, we arrived and we were greeted. And we were greeted by a chap that immediately built us a fire, brought us firewood. And uh, the ablutions are rudimentary. But the interesting thing is that I have hot water and a proper shower all laid on. So the value is much better in terms of the camping facilities. In terms of animals and game, my impression, and this is just an impression, is that it is perhaps more critical in the Zambian parks as to what time of year you visit. Because I don't think we're here at the best time of year. The bush around us here is very dead. It's wintry, it hasn't got its new spring leaves yet, and it's a bit sparse. It's not particularly attractive in this part of the reserve. We've seen very few animals today, and I'm not actually particularly hopeful of animals walking through the camp tonight. But in terms of a setting, the rapids, the Kafala rapids are over there, we'll have a look at them just now. I'm very, very impressed particularly impressed with the service and friendliness of the Zambian authorities and the Zambian parks people. Really impressed. Right, we've walked a bit of a walk over, over rocks to the main river and the rapids and set back is our campsite really well hidden in the trees over there. Uh, not much more really to say. We've just been approached by two of the guys that work here and sort out the camp and everything and they've just charged us another $30, 15 each per person. Uh, and I, I really don't understand it. We were just charged, when we entered the camp, we were charged $63. And it's ridiculous because, I mean, last night we were surrounded by hippos. We heard them coming out of the water. It was an amazing atmosphere heard hyenas and that wasn't technically in the park and we'll charge $20 for that and you're paying fortune now and our guests are baboons which as many campers probably have experienced are not the best guests compared to hyenas, hippos and all that kind of thing so I really don't understand why we're charged a fortune to come into parks when you could go outside for less than half the price. Um, and have a better experience. When uh, traveling in the African bush, one has to handle a certain amount of risk, risk management, if for want of a better word. And firstly, uh, footwear. Uh, one should wear boots, and I know a lot of people don't, they wear sandals, and I believe in a good set of sturdy boots. They will protect mostly against uh, biting insects, scorpions, and if you're unlucky, or lucky, depending on which way you want to look at it, snakes. So, <clears throat> a decent pair of boots. I wear these sometimes around the camp. Although, around the camp, it's equally hazardous on your feet. So I will wear these if I'm having a shower, moving to and from the ablution block and things like that. Uh, but I won't wear them, and I especially won't wear them at night because night, the night critters, you won't see them. Um, and of course, then there's the thing about mosquitoes. You have to protect yourself against mosquitoes. So there are a number of ways of doing that. Um, 
mosquito uh, prophylactics, malaria prophylactics, uh, that's up to your doctor. It's a subject all on its own. So I'm just going to talk about prevention. We've been using these armbands. They uh, contain a citronella uh, sponge, if you like. They, you can smell it, and um, up to now we've only been wearing them at night. And I think they're quite effective. I don't believe they're full protection. They claim, I think, a little more than they actually deliver. But I do think they help. I really do think they help. So we've been wearing them. Um, and an ordinary bug spray. Now this one is called Bugger Off. Um, it is definitely effective, no question about it. But considering how little there is in the can and its cost, I would say it is not good value for money. It's expensive. So, and we've almost run out of it. And I I only bought one can, which is not going to be enough for us, so I'm going to have to try and get some in Lusaka. We'll be in Lusaka in two days' time. That's the capital of Zambia. And we will try and get some more. Probably not this brand, South African brand. We'll probably find something like Peaceful Sleep, which I have always used and it's always been effective. And also pre preventative from mosquito bites. Long trousers. I wear these around the camp in the evening, so when I arrive at camp, and uh, after I've had my shower, I put on long trousers and I will make sure that I spray particularly my socks and my ankles uh, because that's where, that's a, that's a big danger area. Under the leg here also, if it's tight against the skin under the leg, that's where mosquitoes get you. So you'll, you'll find most bites are actually in the lower section and you must use a lot of this, particularly on the lower section and of course the exposed skin. That goes without saying. $95 it cost us to stay here. I consider that a lot of money. And had there been game all over the place, I mean really just an incredible experience, then I might be able to justify it in my mind and want to stay another night and spend that money again. But it's, for me it's just too expensive. If, if, if it had been a different experience I might have might have wanted to stay. But so instead, we're going to a camp just outside the reserve uh, where one doesn't have to pay the very high park fees. And I know we were there two nights ago and it was amazing and we had animal encounters. So I think the value is a lot better out there. The alternative is to go further north uh, where we are told there are lots and lots of animals, but again, very high fees. And perhaps we've come at the wrong time of year. That's debatable, but I'm getting that impression from the people that I've spoken to, it would be better in the wet season. So what we're doing today is we're heading back to the Royce campsite, which is just outside the reserve, and we're going to try and organize a boat, take a boat trip, and experience some of the wildlife that way. Road for a drive. On our way back to Royce camp on the river, the drought is all too obvious. We see hardly any game at all. The most common creature being more of those pesky tsetse flies. And back on the river, the elephant is still there. This time, quite close to where we want to set up camp. We've returned to Hook Bridge Safari Camp. This is actually Roy's Camp. Roy's is the other name. Signpost says Roy's camp and we're back on the river. We were just saying a few minutes ago It's been a very quiet day in terms of filming. Not much has happened We've been on the road didn't see much game this morning and we're preparing for our boat trip Which is going to happen now tomorrow morning and we've had a we have a visitor same elephant that uh, Slowed our progress yesterday on the way to the camp. It's a um, male lone male. He seems quite happy with people around um, He's eating and uh, if he comes over here, we will go over there. But right now, he looks quite happy with things. Okay, fella, what's on your mind? Into, your, into that side of the car. You should get into the uh, no, you, uh, other, side. other side. Walk around the front. The around important the front. thing here is to let the elephant know that we are not a threat, and we do that by backing away.
I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable actually with him. He's, he's uncomfortably close for me. Um, he's, he's aware of us and we're aware of him. And I get the impression that he's very used to people. Okay, get in the car. Where is he? Um, I don't know. Okay, he's walking by. <laughs> okay. Okay. He's fine. He's fine. He's fine. He's looking away from us. Yeah, he's not aggressive. <laughs> that would have been a very tight turn. I'm not sure if the car had that turning circle. The Caesar's turning circle is not the best. Okay. A bit of excitement for the day, don't you think? These videos are made possible by contributions from Patreons. Join the Patreon family now.